my note card so I can write your hard questions. Okay. Actually, they're very easy questions. The answer is maybe hard. Uh, what could and should have been done differently and by whom with ECOP? Uh, look, I'm a strong supporter of school choice, um, and I believe in school choice, and I believe in school choice largely because I think moms and dads are far better about making decisions about what their kids' education entails than faceless, nameless government bureaucrats. Having said that, I also am somebody who believes if you make a promise and you don't keep the promise, you ought to be held accountable. And that ought to be for school choice, charter schools, voucher schools, and it also be, should be for public schools, right? Uh, we ought to have higher expectations. Now, with regard to ECOT, look, I'll, I'll start and say that the concept of online education was something that a lot of us questioned. Um, but uh, early on, the results looked like they were doing an okay job. I actually had one young man from my district who was a competitive clog dancer. I didn't know such a thing existed, but he was an ECOT student. Now, he actually graduated ECOT um, at, at about 15, 16, and now I think he went on to go to a very fancy institution and wrote scholar. It, it worked out well for him. But in the end, it looks like the way they were counting kids didn't work very well. And candidly, I, I go back to technology. I've actually got a bill that we're working on right now that says online schools will monitor their kids online. And there's a software program. There's vendors out there that do this. Any lawyers had to do online CLE? You know, if you're online, they'll check to make sure you're still there. Um, and frankly, I'm surprised they didn't utilize that program. And that would have changed the whole count. It would also look to see what the kids are doing. Now, there are going to be times the kids are online or are, are reading or doing something else. They're not sitting there on the computer. But you ought to be able to answer the question, uh, what your kids are there and what they're doing on a regular basis. The one other mistake, there's an argument that was made about you guys. I'm not getting too deep into the woods here. But there was an argument that the Department of Education changed the standard retroactively. Because originally they said, you just have to show us you have kids. And then they came back and said, we want to see how many hours the kids are logged on. And you kind of said, we didn't have that system. And that might be a good excuse for the first set of numbers. But they didn't do anything to try and manage that, the best I can tell, for the second set of numbers, for the second year. And frankly, I think that's unexcusable. I think Dave Yost is right to put it down there. But make no mistake about it. This is the reason we passed uh, the Charter School Accountability Bill when I was Senate President. Um, history will tell you that we passed it out of the Senate. Worked out in the Senate, the House wasn't going to move it. We came back the, the following period of time, and we worked with the House and got a bill through that, that I think is largely the reason ECOS being shut down, along with a number of other schools. So uh, accountability is an important component. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. That's a fair question. I just want to make sure I answer. Got it. Um, gun laws. Okay. What changes in Ohio would you support? Um, again, now you're asking me as a legislator instead of the state auditor. Is the state auditor going to get to make that um, I am a strong believer in the Second Amendment. I, I think let's distinguish where we're at now for a second, comparing us to Florida. Um, and, and I heard Mike DeWine come out with a list of proposals yesterday at the Lincoln Day dinner that I thought were really solid. But one of the things we did a couple of years ago was we instilled, frankly, after Charter, we instilled a series of school safety and school security measures across the Ohio schools. And in two years ago, we expanded and provided some funding for that to go to some of the, 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 the private and some of the charter and some of the voucher schools as well. That most all school district, every door is locked. And to get into the front door, you have to go through a security vestibule in most schools. And in fact, that would have stopped this kid from just walking in a door at that Florida school. Uh, the second thing we've done is try to empower school safety officers, generally armed school safety officers, to be in a position to respond. Um, I was devastated to hear that a school security officer was killed in Florida. He was unarmed. Uh, you've got to wonder what, what that would have meant and, and how that would have been if he actually had been armed, whether that would have changed it. But the bigger issue for this Florida shooting, in my view, is mental health issues. And one of the things, and I'm going to give Mike DeWine credit for this because he's the one who announced it yesterday. Uh, he plans on putting a school uh, psychologist or school mental health uh, person in every single school in Ohio. <laughs> and he believes that that will go a long way to identifying and helping kids that have, have, have issues. I think that's a good start. But don't forget there were some other failures in this. You also have this, if we're going to say, see something, say something, which is absolutely right, you have to make sure you follow up when somebody sees something and says something. And so I think we ought to be off, uh, open to the concept of having more meaningful discussions about what you do when you find somebody 
who has a problem and what your options are with regard to that person. And I think that that's a, it's a bigger discussion. Now, um, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I think we ought to regulate guns so that we can do things on the gun side because the answer to me is that we have a lot of guns in our society. I don't think you're ever going to get rid of them. I think you have to be careful about the people who have access to guns. And, and candidly, um, I, I just don't think we're going to fix that problem um, by going in and saying, this gun looks like it's neater than that gun. It, it's not going to end or solve the problem. I think we need to do things to make a difference instead of things that sound like they make a difference. Related, what about universal, universal background checks? Um, look, I think that's something we should have a discussion for. Uh, we do have universal background checks if you buy a firearm from a dealer. Uh, the question is how many, and, and by the way, the last three shootings that we've heard about all went through that process. They're only as good as the data that's in the system. And so I think where we need to make sure, and this is another thing I heard Mike DeWine say, they're going to make sure that all of the Ohio reporting entities are reporting <coughs> and they're verified that they're reporting. Um, and, and candidly, that's one of the issues that we have to be solved. Um, with the redistricting issue that is going to be on the May ballot, this is a combination of questions, what in that issue do you think is especially strong and what do you think is its biggest weakness? Um, let, let's talk about redistricting in general. There are two different types of redistricting, one's for state legislative seats and one's for congressional seats. A couple of years ago, we all passed uh, at the ballot with good numbers a uh, state legislative redistricting um, approach that I helped draft. Um, we started on it a number of years ago. It has some fits and starts. Starts with our friends in the house and finally got it out. Um, I remember working with Nina Turner on the very first. You never thought Faber and Nina Turner were going to agree on anything. I love working with Nina Turner. She was great. Um, but Frank, so uh, Frank LaRose and, uh, and then Senator Sawyer uh, worked with us and Nina Turner and I, and, and it took us to 4:30 the final line to get it passed. But I think it had some good things in it. And the big things that I focused on in that proposal are some of the same things that are going to be in the May proposal that's going to be on the ballot. And the first is the importance of drawing compact districts. Districts to where the elected official is actually going to represent the constituents in that district. I think that's important. Um, I think it's important that you not divide political subdivisions, whether it's a county or a city or a township or a village. Um, all of those are important because if you can keep things compact, it works better. I come from a county that's a whopping 43,000 people and we have three congressional representatives. I tried to get us to have one congressman, but it was pretty clear we were gonna have two. And at that point, we had a discussion about Grand Lake St. Mary's, which is, is an area of the state. We said, fine, might as well have three if one of them's got Grand Lake St. Mary's. It made sense. The reality is, um, when you look at congressional districts or state legislative districts, people wanna be represented by somebody who shares their values. And if you're not doing compact districts, you get away from that. Uh, I could draw a district literally from Akron to Columbus if I wanted to, to achieve whatever demographic result I want to find. But I'm telling you to do that, I'm having to slice and dice and divide communities. And I think that avoids it. I think the May proposal has that. Uh, for a long time, I, I tend to believe the United States Constitution when it says state legislatures will draw um, congressional districts. Um, the Supreme Court said that could mean a commission. Um, from that perspective, I like the fact that the one that's going to the ballot in May keeps the legislature involved. I would probably prefer just applying the same standards to the congressional districts in general that we apply to drawing the legislative districts under the districting commission. Uh, but the reality is, uh, I think the process they have is a little clunky um, on the congressional <coughs> district, but I think it will work. It starts out that the legislature starts to draw with less requirements. If they can't get a super majority, bipartisan majority, it goes to the redistricting commission that I'm running for. By the way, the redistricting commission includes the auditor, secretary of state, governor, and four legislators, two Democrats and two Republicans. So that's seven people that will draw the legislative lines and will have a role in the congressional lines if the legislature can't draw them. Um, then if the redistricting commission can't pass a map, with bipartisan uh, support, meaning at least two of the seven people have to, two of the minority members have to join with the majority members. Very high standard. Uh, then it goes back to the legislature to draw a map with lower uh, vote requirements on a bipartisan basis, but more restrictions. They say it's gerrymandered. So that's the process. I think it's a little clunky, but I think it can be very effective to reach the result. We need to have better, more compact, more representative districts.
Did I answer that question? That's a complicated topic. Did I answer the question? Answer the question? Sure. Okay. Had to shake you so I could stop. <laughs> Can you talk specifically about how you see performance auditors audits promoting greater efficiency in state government? Yes. Can you offer some specifics? Sure. Um, I, I gave one on the DAS. The two areas, I, I, there's a list of areas that I think are right for performance audits. Remember, performance audits are mandatory with state agency. The auditor has to consult with the speaker and the president of the Senate to determine which agencies get audits, but they're mandatory on the state level. Local performance audits are, are permissive, and they have to essentially be requested. We're going to ask local governments to come in and partner with that under a partnership basis, not a gotcha basis. Look, I understand why local government officials don't necessarily like the idea of having somebody from the state come in and tell them they aren't doing a very good job, they can do it better. So what you have to do that is to make process improvement partnership with local government officials. So on the state side, and this is the area we're going to spend most of our attention, is candidly we're going to tee up the Department of Administrative Safe and Services procurement methodology, particularly for IT services, because there's literally tens or hundreds of millions of dollars being left on the table. The second area we're going to tee up is Medicaid. And make no mistake, Medicaid is roughly 50% of the state budget. And so just because it's such a large component of the state budget, you have lots of opportunity. But let me give you one example on Medicaid. And then I'll talk about another one that we all care about, and that's opiates. But on Medicaid, by looking at data analytics, you can look at whether billing codes are overbilling, um, not with absolute certainty, but with some demographic certainty, for certain performance codes. For example, if you've got a hospital or a, a general type of area that's always billing for the most expensive codes, it may be that that's particularly appropriate because this provider has high acuity patients, very sick patients. But it may be that they figured out how to manipulate the system. You need, you need to ask that second question. And so we're going to look at the processes that the Department of Administrative Services and frankly the Department of Medicaid uses on making those decisions and how they reach that. The, the second part is on opiates. Look, we are spending a boatload of money to try and address and get in front of this opiate crisis that we've got in the state. Um, we do a very poor job when the legislature appropriates and say we're going to use science-based history-based examples of what works. Um, I don't know what you, the, the non-judicial interface opiate treatment programs in Ohio have a success rate of less than 20%. Less than 20%. That means for every five people you send, only one succeeds. That's not great. We know when we tie opiate with, with court intervention and opiate treatment with court interventions and other things, success rates go up. They don't go up. 100%, but they go up. Looking at what works in programs that are particularly successful versus ones that aren't particularly successful will help us focus very limited state dollars. But the other thing that's part of this is a discussion about alternatives that ought to be used in this treatment mechanism. And, and the one I'll just give you, and this came from my conversations with the local elected officials. We are spending a lot of money on opiate treatment and opiate through Medicaid. What we're not spending is an equal amount of money on education. There's only 100% successful opiate avoidance program, and that's getting somebody not to start. And if we could spend more money on education to train and teach people not to start, and I'm thinking about this. You remember a couple of years ago, you used to see that frying pan with a couple of eggs? This is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. Okay. Not that I remember it, it had to be fairly effective. But we need to convince kids uh, to not start. And, and look, I don't think that's the panacea. We've got to treat the people who are there. We've got to work on all the, all the pressures and societal issues and stop the trafficking and fentanyl and all of the other things. But it surprises me when we did an analysis of this after some requests is how little money we're spending in comparison on education and prevention. And so that's one of the questions we're going to have to ask. Again, I don't prejudge the results, but I think it's important to have a performance audits of those programs. And we're going to continue to have that discussion across the board. Now, that's just two of them. I can give you another five or six that I think are right. The first one's going to be the Ohio Department of Education. Um, candidly, it's a not very effective operational agency. So with that, I've answered a couple. So next question. OK. Um, your, the man you hope to succeed, Dave Yost, has been pretty critical of the rollout of the medical marijuana program. Uh, some have called for a halt, at least temporarily, on rolling it out. Where do you stand? 
Um, I, I think when you look at what happened to the Department of Commerce on the rollout of the Mar medical marijuana program, it has a lot of concerns. When you have a felon looking at the applications, I'm really concerned how that ever happened. Uh, when you have now uh, the Department of Commerce saying, oh, yeah, our staff had access to everybody's applications. It did go in and make a little changes here and there. And oh, by the way, the person who was suing us, we determined that some changes were made. And by the way, they're going to get a permit now. It raises a lot of reflex. And so I think that whole system needs to be evaluated and questioned. Now the problem you've got is once you've made awards and people have started reliance on those awards, what do you do? Go back and say, hey, we were just kidding. By the way, I know you've broken ground and you're starting to build your facilities and you're trying to get up and running because you have a very narrow time frame to do that. Just kidding. We're going to reallocate. It's the problem of not having the system in place to do it right the first time. And frankly, I'm a little critical of the Department of Commerce for that. Um, the question is how do you fix it, and that's going to be the question that I think has to go to the governor and the legislature. Uh, it may be that you have to expand the number of permits that are authorized and redo the reallocation uh, so it's fair and people have confidence in it. The problem we had when we agreed to vote for medical marijuana in the state were that this is an industry, frankly not unlike gaming, that in other places where it's done have led to questions about confidence and integrity. You cannot have a state-blessed program, in my view, that has integrity problems. Um, I was not in favor of casino gambling in this state. However, when it passed, I got tasked by the then Senate President to draft the regulatory scheme that regulates Ohio gaming. And when we did that, we took great strides to look at what was done in the country and take the best practices from around the country and put them in place. And you have not heard the problems in Ohio's gaming system that they had in some of the other states that started up gaming. And I think it's largely because we brought experts in from around the country and said, tell us what works, tell us what doesn't work. And then we rolled it out slow. And we did it in a controlled way that made sense. Frankly, the medical marijuana situation, I think, needed the same approach. I was not for medical marijuana expansion. Um, and, and the reason for it for me are, are, are more about the drug issues that I just talked about. But having said that, if we're going to have it, it needs to be done, it needs to be regulated, it needs to be clean, and it needs to be transparent. And, and if you ask me a question about transparency, I've got a good answer for that. Well, first I'll ask you a question about the legislature. What can and should it be doing right now? Um, I always say you're safer when the legislature's not in session. Uh, so right now, I would argue the legislative priorities could, could, could step back and focus on the things that matter. Um, but the reality is the legislature works pretty well. Um, if the constituents have an idea about what ought to be done, the constituents should bring it to the legislature. If the best idea is the best legislation, it doesn't come from the mind of the legislator. I know this shocks some of you. It comes from the mind of the constituents. Um, and you know, one of the bills I'm working on personally uh, is one that brought from a constituent. And how many of you have gotten a call on your smart device from somebody who said, you just called my number, okay, when you didn't call their number? That's called telephone number spoofing. Okay, and it's being used by scammers and other people. And what they're really doing is stealing your telephone number. Um, it's very deceptive. They do it so people will answer and then think it's somebody local calling. So we've got a piece of legislation that came from a constituent that we're working to try and limit that. Now, the reality is some of this is coming from Nigeria. No matter what I do, I can't stop the Nigerian king who wants to give you all his money. But what we can do is try and make it tougher and put some, some guardrails around it. Um, but largely right now, the legislature should be focusing on the opioid issue, and I think they are. Uh, largely right now, the legislature should be focusing on um, taking a look holistically at the way state agencies run. And, and frankly, they're doing some of that. I think we could do more. Well, speaking of how state agencies want, run, um, we have a state building in Akron that is not being properly maintained. The Ocasek building has a roof that leaks. What changes at administrative services can be made now to make them do their job better? Performance audits um, are the best way to, to deal with that from the auditor standpoint, but the reality is I think you have to bring it to people's attention. And sunshine is the best disinfectant. Um, you know, I had this conversation about somebody who said, Keith, you can do the performance audits, but you can't make them do what you say they're going to do. You're right. The auditor doesn't have a club. What I have is a report and the ability to have my friends in the media make sure that those reports are explored and you ask the question of why they're not being implemented. So you use sunshine in that capacity and talk about it. And you can always uh, call our office or call another legislator's office and get to DAS and figure out why it's not being taken care of. But uh, I, I just would argue that there are things at DAS that I think need some work. How do you 
think what is playing out on the national political stage will be felt in Ohio this year? Great question. Uh, my crystal ball were that clear. Um, I can tell you it would be a lot easier to run up for a statewide office. Um, I think ultimately right now, if you look at all the demographics, um, Ohioans are, are relatively satisfied statewide on average um, with what's going on in Ohio. Um, they're relatively satisfied with the fact that we cut taxes, we focused on jobs. Ohio seems to be working pretty well. Um, so that, I think, is, is, is an interesting term. I think most Ohioans would say they wish that Donald Trump would stop talking. Um, but uh, again, most, a lot of people say they're pretty pleased with what the president has done. Uh, cutting taxes, I think, are a good thing. It's spurring economic activity. You're seeing companies now responding to the tax cuts by increasing their employees' wages and giving bonuses. Um, you see a host of other things that are going on that are helping make a difference. Regulatory reform. Frankly, I think most Ohioans like the fact that we did the Common Sense Initiative and has reduced new regulatory filings in this state by 50%. And the fact that by doing that, we really haven't sacrificed clean air, clean water, healthy, safe work environments. That's happening at the national level. So the political environment's an interesting question. If um, political historians would tell you that the first midterm election for a new president generally doesn't go well for their party. Um, Donald Trump has proven the exception to every other political rule, like how he got elected. Um, I'm confident that that's going to be well too. And I think when you talk about candidates and differentiate what they stand for and what they're doing, I, I think Republicans will do just fine in this election cycle. Um, oh, wait, there's one more. <laughs> and it's not a nice wrap up question like we usually do. Best, basically, it comes down to why is the state auditor's position a partisan political position? Um, because the Ohio Constitution says it is, uh, is the quick answer. Um, in, in some ways, it's not. It's a partisan election. But it's not a partisan position. Um, I have said this around the state for over a year um, as I've asked people to support me. Um, I'm running for auditor not to be a Republican auditor. I'm running for auditor to be a good government, clean government, more efficient, effective, transparent go uh, government auditor. I think we can do better. And that's why I looked early on in my first conversation that I had when I ran for auditor. Uh, I built on the fact that we can do better if we're willing to rethink the way we do some common things in government. One example that I haven't given yet um, that I think is very important is, is how we did on public records. We had this issue in public records law that everybody kind of knew what public records law was. It's just nobody followed it. And then to get your public records, you had to engage in very expensive, time-consuming litigation. I looked at that. I've been a mediator for now 23 years. And I said, this doesn't make any sense. So I sat down and we drafted the public records mediation program. And by doing the public records mediation program, we have successfully successfully <laughs> taken most public record litigation and ended it. Now for 25 bucks, you can file a dispute on public records. And out of the 130 or so, I just got the data on the way up here, or so disputes, almost all of them, but for maybe a dozen or so, resulted in the records being given either pre-mediation or after mediation. And a few went to decision by the magistrate. But in those cases, almost almost insignificant numbers were appealed. You can make government work better, you just have to think about how it's going and figure out how to do it better. The state auditor's office is the one place in state government that you can do that. And that's why I said when I'm state auditor, we're going to put in part of the, the uh, management uh, letters that come from an audit, how well you're doing at complying with public records. Because frankly, there's no excuse for a local government or a state agency not to be doing real well of performing in, in, in public records disputes. And so by giving that information to the public in the report, you can help people get better and make it more transparent. But part of that is also saying, okay, city, what are the most 10 most requested sets of public records you have? Why don't you put those online? Instead of having to have people come and say, give me my police report, just put it online where you can type in and get it. The, in this day of scanners and technology, you can put anything online pretty easily. The point is, is what are you doing to make that? And we're going to put that as part of our audit report, as part of our recommendations. And, and I think that's how you make government more transparent. And so to get back to your question as a wrap-up, why should the auditor be a partisan position? It isn't. It's just a partisan election. And, and I would argue that it's important that whoever your state auditor is, wake up every morning saying, hmm, 
What can I do to make Ohio work better for Bob and Betty Buckeye? What can I do to make sure that our kids and grandkids have the same God-given opportunity to meet their potential that our parents and grandparents left us? That's why I'm running into your state auditor, and that's how I think we can make the auditor's office look better. Okay. Thank you very much.